Dr. Aniket Mohite. He did his MBBS from Chet GS Medical College and MD Medicine from LTMMC and Sion Hospital, Mumbai. He did his uh, DM Hematology from Chet GS Medical College. He is in fellowship in uh, bone marrow transplant from uh, Tata Memorial Hospital, Kharger. Fellowship in BMT uh, from Vancouver General Hospital, Canada. Editorial board member in EMJ. He is a consultant hematologist and BMT physician in Kolhapur Cancer Center, Kolhapur, and currently uh, working as a consultant hematologist and BMT physician in Jahangir Hospital, Pune. Thank you, sir. So the talk which I have to deliver is approach to bleeding disorder. We all have seen a lot of patients who present with bleeding problems, which could be because of either low platelets, could be because of uh, coagulopathies. So how does usually bleeding stop? Bleeding is the first phase is vasoconstriction. That is the vessel which have arterial or venous vasoconstriction or the capillary vasoconstriction followed by a platelet plug formation after which the coagulation cascade takes over and leads to a fibrin stable clot. So these are the three major steps. So all the three things, the vessel wall is important to stop bleeding. So collagen problems can also be present with bleeding problems. Platelet may be functional or numerical reduction in the platelet count can lead to bleeding, which would be the second phase is deficient or clotting cascade is deficient, which is causing the bleeding. So the component of hemostasis, like we discussed, is uh, primary hemostasis versus secondary hemostasis. The primary hemostasis would be the, from the vessel wall and the secondary would be from the coagulation factors. So this is, again, the same diagram showing initial vasoconstriction where the platelets and von Willebrand factor lead to platelet plug formation and any endothelial injury. Sorry, any endothelial injury which is causing the bleeding, this is how the first or the primary hemostasis would be then followed by once the platelet plug is formed, the temporary hemostasis is achieved with vasoconstriction and platelet plug, which is then further strengthened by formation or activation of the clotting cascade, which would uh, then lead to formation of thrombin followed by fibrin and with fibrin stabilizing factor will lead to formation of clot. So the clotting doesn't stop here. Wherever the clotting has happened, that also has to be regeneralized. So we have the fibrinolytic pathway also in our system, like the tissue plasminogen, which activates and leads to clot degradation after the bleeding has stopped and recanalization of the vessel. So the clotting cascade can be divided commonly into the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway. The extrinsic pathway is factor seven with tissue factor of the vascular injury, which leads to activation of factor 10 and the common pathway and the intrinsic pathway, which we usually see in the labs with the glass coding activation of or surface activation of factor 12 and then factor 11, factor eight, factor nine, together causing activation of factor 10 and down the common pathway. So the common point of both pathways is activation of factor 10. Factor 10 activates further prothrombin to thrombin and thrombin in turn converts fibrinogen to fibrin and factor 13 then converts fibrin to fibrin stabilizing factor, which leads to stabilization or stopping of the bleeding. So bleeding disorders can uh, grossly be divided into three problems problems of the platelet, which could be quantitative because of platelet uh, reduction with ITP or drug induced, which has already been covered by Nilesa, or could be because of a qualitative or functional thrombocytopenia or a functional platelet dysfunction, which is Glanzmann's thrombosthenia, von Willebrand disorder or Berners Olea syndrome or acquired like in liver disease or alcoholism. Vascular disorders could be HHT, hereditary hemorrhagic telinectasia, early and loss, or commonest like vitamin C deficiency causing scurvy and gum bleeding 
Fibrinolytic pathway, we see this because of the streptokinase or urokinase or the TPA, which we give as a therapy for a lot of thrombotic problems, MI, uh, or an early presentation with stroke or for pulmonary embolisms. Coagulation factor deficiencies could be acquired like vitamin K deficiency, which would be dietary or because of liver disease or warfarin or because of DIC associated with infections or congenital, which are inherited. The commoner ones have been listed in this, which is hemophilia A or von Willebrand disease and other rare factor deficiencies amongst the casket. So what is important? How, how do you approach? Because the, like we saw, there are at least 12 factors which are there in the clotting casket. There are platelets which are causing, there are platelet function defects. There are collagen problems which can also cause bleeding. So how do we assess what would be the cause of bleeding in that particular patient? So we need to dig into detail as to how much is the bleeding history in that particular patient? When was the onset of the bleeding? What are the episodes of minor bleeding? Minor bleeding like cutaneous bleeding, uh, which would be spontaneous or which could be after trauma, especially patients, uh, whether they have only mucosal bleeding like epistaxis, oral bleeding or malina or PR bleeds or whether there were any joint bleeds also associated with it, whether there is any history of life-threatening bleeds like intracranial bleeds or massive GI bleeds or abdominal bleeds, which are a, mas a masquerade or which can mimic anything like a mass, especially like hemophilia where a suasimatoma would look like a mass sitting in the abdomen. So bleeding after hemostatic, hemostatic challenge. Uh, Another problem in Indian scenarios, what we face is we do not, uh, we consider some things of bleeding problems as normal, like menorrhagia is, a, is considered to be normal if her siblings or her is, uh, if the family history is there in the mother is also having excess PV bleeding or in the siblings also have an excess PV bleeding. So they consider that this is a normal thing, which is running in their families and the, we don't need to express that to the doctor. So something like that has to be digged into detail because a puberty menorrhagia would be a common presentation for something like a von Willebrand disease. So the onset from where it started, whether it started in the childhood for something like hemophilia or whether it started in adulthood, so something like would be called as acquired, where you can have acquired von Willebrand with myeloproliferative neoplasms, or you can have acquired hemophilias because of development of antibodies like in lupus or because of malignancies. So family history is important. We need to draw a pedigree chart like we do in thalassemias or any other inheritable disorders, whether this is an autosomal dominant, whether this is an X-linked disorder, what was the inheritance and how much is the percentage of inheritance. Specific history related to some factor deficiencies can also guide us whether they have a delayed umbilical cord bleeding at birth, which would could be a fact uh, which is commonly associated in 80% of cases with factor 13 deficiency, hemarthrosis, that is bleeding in the joints, which could be seen commonly in hemophilia A, which is amongst the commonest bleeding disorder, along with von Willebrand, hemophilia B, or factor 10 deficiency. The one of the differentiating factor between hemophilia A or hemophilia A and von Willebrand, which both can have low factor 8 levels, which we would come in the next few slides, is uh, von Willebrand presents only with mucosal bleeds, whereas hemophilia can present with mucosal as well as joint bleeds. So recurrent pregnancy loss is seen in a fibrinogenemia or in factor 13 deficiency. So some of these specific points or specific history or direct questions can guide us as to how we work them up further. So coming to family history, X-linked is hemophilia A or hemophilia B, that is factor 8 and factor 9 deficiency. Uh, autosomal dominant are dysfibrinogenemia and von Willebrand disease. Some of the von Willebrand disease are autosomal recessive, specifically type 2N and type 3. Autosomal recessives of other rare factor deficiencies of factor 2, factor 7, 10, 11, and 13 are autosomal recessive. Uh, platelet dysfunction like Glensman's thrombosthenia or Berner solid syndrome are all autosomal recessive. Factor 8 with factor 5 combined deficiency is also autosomal recessive. So this is what I, uh, this is just an illust, uh, the whole summary again, as to we need to uh, dig, deeper, uh, dig deeper into the provoked as well as unprovoked 
and significant as well as episodes of recurrent bleeding the other history which we also need to elicit is whether they require any transfusion support or iron supplements or any uh, repeated admissions for the same whether that will give us whether the bleeding was severe enough that they require hospital admissions or whether that could be just managed in the outpatient basis so usually uh, ent physicians see epistaxis common which is seen in all these bleeding disorders but they need to be dig deeper whether they require transfusion support and the epistaxis is significant enough we see epistaxis in other common individuals which don't have bleeding disorders also so some of these common bleedings we need to elicit whether they need further workup for uh, a hematological or a bleeding disorder per se so based on this we need to uh, get to a consensus to formulate a differential diagnosis of whether this is an inherited or acquired and then work them up accordingly this is again the same thing which influences the presenting problems like what i uh discuss whether this is a, an acquired or congenital there are nature and severity of the defect and presence of single or multiple factors of bleeding like the patient can have thrombocytopenia because of liver disease and have coagulopathies causing bleeding along with an infection with dic in an alcoholic liver disease so what are the factors which are contributory and what is the coagulation pathway or what are amongst the bleeding problems are there patients with renal failure can have functional platelet disorders whether they are on anticoagulation like heparin or whether they were dialyzed heparin free or heparin containing dialysis whether they are on anticoagulation or antiplatelet drugs and that whether they are on any other associated medications also needs to be illustrated so this is just the bleeding assessment score uh, which gives the scoring which is the ishbt bleeding assessment tool which uh, has 0 to 4 scores for each bleeding symptom epistaxis cutaneous minor wounds oral cavity gi bleed hematuria and after calculating the score we then determine whether the patient needs to be further worked up for bleeding disorder or not so these are the usual tools that we have in our hand a cbc with a differential count with a manual platelet count a peripheral blood film for platelet morphology to see if that that could give us a clue platelet aggregation studies to determine whether there are platelet uh, glansman or von willebrand or bernard solier and von willebrand ristocytin assays coagulation factors and antibodies to coagulation factors in acquired hemophilias factor 13 levels and fibrinolytic pathways we use thromboelastogram as a global hemostasis pathway so clinical history screening test based on the test whether pt apt is abnormal if only the apt is prolonged whether they have factor 8 or factor 9 pt is prolonged factor 10 or whether they have both prolonged which would then come down to a combined pathway so commonly as a pre surgical workup we can avoid this uh, we usually do only btct or only pta inr and many of the times the bleeding history is missed or previous transfusion history is missed and they we detect them when they are undergone surgery and the bleeding is not stopping so these scenarios can be avoided by just doing an aptt and mixing test is if they have factor deficiency so if the any person is having low amount of factor and we mix them with a normal plasma or a normal pool plasma and if that is correcting which indicates that they were deficient in that factor and it is correcting with the normal plasma or a normal person who has that amount normal amount of that particular factor we cannot determine which factor he was deficient but that would give us if the pt is prolonged and we are it is getting corrected with the factor uh, or the plasma that is indicating that it this could be factor 7 if it is only apt prolonged then correction would then give us an idea that could be factor 8 factor 9 or factor 11 and if the pt inr both are normal then it could be factor 13 because it is a fibrin stabilizing factor it is towards the end after the fibrinogen is formed and if both are prolonged pt inr both are prolonged then this could be a fibrinogenemia or low fibrinogen like what we see in bic as well secondly if the mixing is not correcting 
then you suspect there could be an inhibitor or an antibody like lupus. So a common scenario as to how to collect and what to send the sample in. So whenever you like we do a CBC, we have to do the platelet function test. So a platelet function test has to be processed within two hours. Otherwise, uh, it will lead to erroneous reports. So it is year done in only in KM Pune and in NIH Mumbai. So these are the only two institutes who commonly perform this platelet function studies. To some extent, it is done in Sayadri also. Uh, it is giving you a lot of uh, information when you have factor eight, which is low, whether this is just factor eight deficiency or whether this is von Willebrand or whether this is platelet function disorders. When you have all the clotting workup, like all the PTNR is normal, your factor 13 is normal, and you still have a patient presenting with bleeding, which could be Glanzmann's like disorder. So APTT, this is a blue top container. CBC, we commonly send in a purple top container. So in the same, we can send platelet function studies. In the APTT, we can send PT, INR, APTT, lupus anticoagulant, fibrinogen level can also be uh, calibrated from the same as well as factor assays. For factor assays, you require larger volumes. So you require two to three tubes of PT, INR. Pseudothrombocytopenia because of EDTA. So only in patients who have EDTA related thrombocytopenia, which Sir had uh, shown a slide, which was pans uh, thrombocytopenia, where you could see platelet clumps. We can see platelet clumps in some patients because of EDTA also. In such cases only, you can send it from the sighted bulb. So the commonest problem in bleeding is hemophilia. So I'll just discuss that in brief and then we can go to the cases. So you can see a pedigree chart where the father does not have hemophilia, the mother is a carrier. So there is a 50% chance of each girl child born would be carrier and 50% chance of having a normal and 50% chance of having a normal child and 50% chance of having an affected hemophilic child. So because this is an X-linked, the mother will be a carrier, she will be asymptomatic, the grand, his grandfather would be the affected individual and the grandson would be the affected individual, but not everybody is affected. So you can have some normal persons and also genetic, his own genetics can affect, even though they have low factors, we do not see the same bleeding in two siblings, both who are severe hemophilic. So there are additional genetic issue, uh, factors, which influence the bleeding, uh, number of bleedings in patient. But if a patient is severe hemophilic, he will remain a severe hemophilic for lifelong. The factor number, if that is less than 1%, it is going to remain 1%. So repeating it every now and then is not going to change the value. So once repeated, and it was not a transfused patient who had received plasma and then was given the factor sample. In, other than that cases, we can rely on one report which would give us the idea whether what severity he would stand in. So hemophilia A is an X-linked recessive disorder. It typically affects males and is carried by females. In some cases, females may be affected like Turner syndrome or lionization, where it could be rarely the female being affected. Two thirds of the cases are inherited. 30% of the cases can be without any family history. So we classify hemophilia or any factor deficiency based on the amount of factor. Severe hemophilics are less than 1% or it could be an undetectable factor. Moderate is 1 to 5. They have some amount of factor. So the bleeding issues are only after surgery or after stress or a severe injury like a road traffic accident. Mild hemophilics are walking around just like us in the society without any bleeding problems. They only bleed after major surgery or after a severe trauma. So these are the patients who could be missed and the PT, APT, I mean the APTT in factor eight deficiency would be just mildly raised or could be just within the upper limit of normal. So these are the cases which could be missed and could be detected before they go into surgery by doing an APTT and factor assay. So hemophilia is suspected in patients presenting with history of easy bruising in early childhood, spontaneous bleeds, particularly in the joint muscles and soft tissue, which would differentiate it from Von Willebrand, excessive bleeding following surgery or trauma, and family history in about two-thirds of the cases, 
definitive diagnosis is important because we have factor concentrates rather than giving them plasma and cryo we now have factor concentrates which can be just diluted and large amount of factors can be delivered within 5 minutes to stop the bleeding rather than giving plasma for hours together so it, this would be the typical uh, lab the cbc is normal the clotting time is prolonged and aptt is prolonged this is the commonest presentation that they can have joint bleeds with swollen joints which are painful tender and that would further lead to contractures life threatening bleeding can be in the neck and throat which could cause uh, something like uh, asphyxia or intracranial bleeds can be life threatening which can cause sudden death also so even a history of sudden icy bleed and death or road traffic accident followed by icy bleed which could not be uh, salvaged because of bleeding would also be something uh, digger digging into their history whether someone of their family members died because of such problem so hemarthrosis is the commonest in around 70 80% of cases muscle bleeding are around 10% of cases and cns bleeds are fortunately less common this i have already discussed but uh, ileus was bleed which could present with back pain abdominal pain or tingling numbness like a sciatica pain or de- decreased hip range of motion which would be an swas bleed which can be treated with factor and with physiotherapy so the price therapy in hemophilia is first protect the injured part by keeping it still so that you cover it rest for 24 to 48 hours ice application to reduce the swelling every 1 to 2 hours le compress the injured part by wrapping it and elevate so that elevate above the level of heart so that the pain is reduced so one unit of factor 8 increases the factor level by 2% one unit of factor 9 increases by 1% so you calculate as per the site of bleeding and the severity of bleeding for minor surgery 30% of factor is good enough like a patient with hemophilia can undergo any surgery if we provide them proper factor coverage uh, dr manoj sir and uh, all our km team have performed lot of orthopedic knee replacements ic bleed surgeries and lot of uh, even patients who have inhibitors who have undergone safe outcomes without any bleeding issues if we provide them adequate factor coverage so this is the usual factor coverage if they have life threatening bleeds we target 100% and we continue to give that if there is a major surgery around 80% is what would be the target desmopressin does have some role in those who have mild bleedings and can be used but the problem with this is it has tachyphylaxis secondly sodium or hyponatremia is a common side effect so it is to be avoided in children as well as in elderly where small changes in the sodium can be disastrous so coming to the first case this is a 30 year old who presents with excessive bleeding pti uh, is normal inr is 1.2 apdt is 33 and fibrin is normal the cbc and the differential with the smear is normal so what else on history will you ask about what are the investigations will you order and what will be your differential at this time so possibly we'll like to know the family history whether they have any similar history in the family mm. one will brand disease can present with normal pt apt or this could be even platelet function disorders or von willebrand and what would be the transfusion or after surgical chain uh, minor surgical procedures like dental extraction or in children whenever they have fall of the tooth and of the deciduous tooth and new tooth eruption whether they have bleeding which was profuse it doesn't always require a dental extraction but when the kids in especially in congenital bleeding disorders this could be a factor where they were the bleeding was not stopped despite lot of efforts and they require pressures or they require transfusion support for the same along with pause and the usual medications so the workup of von willebrand will include von willebrand antigen factor rate as well as risotecin cofactor factor 13 can be detected by antigen based assays or clot solubility assays platelet aggregation studies endothelial dysfunctions and fibrinolytic pathways would be 
the other associated things. So in this patient, we had factor seven, which is normal, factor nine, which is 64%, von Willebrand and factor eight is normal, Ristocetin is normal, and factor 13 is abnormal. So this is a case of factor 13 deficiency. In such cases, a history of umbilical cord bleed, or they are at very risk of bleeding in the brain, that is IC bleed at birth or post in their childhood after a trivial fall, they can develop IC bleed in severe factor 13 deficiency. Mixing study is to rule out inhibitor that we already discussed and should be confirmed by a quantitative method. It is bleeding is usually not significant unless the factor is less than 5%. It could be inherited or acquired and it is around in a frequency of 1 in 20 lakhs. Umbilical stump bleeding would be seen in 80% of the cases and recurrent pregnancy loss and poor wood healing can be the presentation. So second case, you have a 36 year old female who has spontaneous first trimester abortions with associated significant bleeding history, no other bleeding history in the form of menorrhagia, no other bleeding history, no family history, no other medications. And the INR is more than eight or it is undetectable and the APDT is more than 150. So on the mixing studies, this is what the mixing would help us with that the PT neat is APDT neat is one more than 150 seconds with mix. It is coming down to normal. The PT neat is more than 80 seconds. So both the PT as well as APDT is beyond the detectable levels and it is correcting with the mixing studies. So the problem in such cases would be in the common pathway that is fibrinogen factor two, that is thrombin factor five or factor 10, or could be combined factor deficiencies like factor eight and factor nine. So in this, we did two, five and 10, both were normal and the fibrinogen is un undetectable or less than 30, which is a, a case of a fibrinogenemia. So usually they'll present with recurrent first trimester miscarriages, and this could be a history which should be elicited along with uh, digging into their PV or menstrual bleed or PR bleed. They would be also at a risk of IC bleed, especially in childhood or umbilical cord bleed, which could be elicited from their mothers. 62 year old female scheduled for laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Her CBCT, uh, CBC is normal, differential is normal, INR is normal and APTT is deranged. The surgical challenges that you would know whether she required any transfusion history, family history and thrombosis or autoimmune workup and previous blood workup if that was done. The differential diagnosis would be factor 8, factor 9, 11 or 12 and whether there is a possibility of inhibitor which could be acquired like lupus or antibodies like in SLE or malignancy. So not every APTT presents with bleeding problem. So the reason why I had included this slide was patient has deranged APTT. It is correcting with mixing and they can have factor 12 deficiency. So factor 12 deficiency or Hegeman factor is the top in the coagulation cascade. It is usually activated by glass or surfaces and it doesn't present with bleeding manifestation but it will only present with a deranged APTT. 67 year old male presented with abnormal INR. INR is 2.7, fibrinogen is normal. PT mixing demonstrated correction. An additional factor was factor seven deficiency, which was obvious that we saw in the previous workup. So this is an interesting case where a 39 year old male presents with to a gastroenterologist with easy bruising and GI bleeding. He was working in a construction and played hockey without any bleeding history. He had bleeding from his wisdom tooth extraction or he had no bleeding during his wisdom tooth extraction or tonsillectomy. So this is obviously less likely to be inherited and there is no family history. Hemoglobin WBC platelet is normal. INR is between 1.5 to 2.5 persistently and APTT is mildly deranged. 
he had normal pt ability looking back at his previous reports in 2013 so the coagulation uh, patient you have to also look at to differentiate whether this was inherited or acquired as whatever workup has been done in the past ask them to bring even from the smallest document that they have from childhood or during vaccination history whether they had any history of hematoma after giving im injections mixing studies corrected ptinr so in you here you can see all the other factors are normal and factor 10 is found to be low this is what his endoscopy was showing there is lot of amyloid deposits and this is a case of amyloidosis or al amyloidosis where factor 10 would be binding to the beta pleated seed seed uh, structures of the amyloid and will cause clearance will lead to acquired factor 10 deficiency so this is the last case which uh, like manoj sir and nilesh sir has also been explained that this is like in hematological emergency we are always on our toes 22 year old patient presented to an er with multiple lower extremity bruising which was spontaneous four days developed four days before presentation isolatedly on the feet without any prior history of bleeding and this is the only the ecchymosis that she had and this is what the blood film shows so this is typically a case of apml so not all bleeding disorders all inherited they could be acquired associated with some malignancy or amyloidosis or inhibitors as well or could be because of apml which is a very treatable case and we always try to correct this i had not taken slides for dic because that was to be uh, covered by dr prathamesh but unfortunately he is not here if there are any questions i like to take thank you thank you so much dr aniket mohite for enlightening us how to approach the case of bleeding disorder uh and you have shown the importance of various factors that most of the major surgeries we avoid just because of some bleeding disorders but with the availability of these factors we can very well go ahead with the even the surgeries also as a physician i can ask only one question uh, we get many emergencies especially the myocardial infarction can you give some hematological tips uh, when a case of uh, infarction had come to us and we want to give the fibrinolytic or thrombolytic therapy and even in the patients of a stroke also as a clinician to which patients as an hematologist we should avoid the thrombolysis or fibrinolysis uh, where there, there's an emergency and we want to give the thrombolysis just some tips sir if there is an uh, like the thrombosis like an mi or a stroke and thrombolysis is required is that a bleeding existing bleeding disorder patient or you are just talking about the general population patient who is a clinically he came to us with a huh. case of myocardial infarction yeah and uh, we want to give the thrombolysis so which are the patients who needs some attention and some hematological tips from your side yes these are the patient to whom you should avoid thrombolysis so you can always thrombolyze the hematological patients it is only to be avoided when they have low platelet or they have coagulopathies especially this could be or they have high hemoglobin where polycythemia vera can present with coagulable uh, problems so bringing down their hemoglobin also itself can improve the vascular structure or the blood supply uh, in such cases if that is a frank mi you can go ahead with the thrombolysis in uh, the patients and hemoglobin can be dealt later in or if it is a stroke with pv or an mpn presenting with a thrombosis you can go ahead with the thrombolytic work uh, if their pt epidity is within normal limits the hemoglobin and pt inr and epdt are the basic tests which we have to uh, do or we have to rigorously follow before thrombolyzing any patient because if they already have many of these thrombotic illnesses can present with thrombosis as well as bleeding like lupus so you have to work them up so that 
the monitoring later on thrombolysis is not contraindicated in hematological illnesses the workup or the further plan of management or the monitoring if they you have to do a baseline workup before thrombolysis so that uh, how long the anticoagulation uh, this would be dealt by dr suraj in the next talk so how long the anticoagulation is required or how uh, the dose of thrombolysis doesn't change whether this is a thrombotic illness or not and uh, you just have to give the standard dose if any questions are there from the forum they can be asked so yeah that is a normal phenomenon like this is called as senile purpura this is because of loss of collagen so like we see in earlier dan loss or other collagen deficiencies this is just because the skin is thinning and there is loss of collagen so they can have spontaneous or just with trivial trauma they will have bruising if the cbc and ptinr is normal like they can have lupus and all their acquired deficiencies also we just need to do the baseline workup if that is normal then we don't need to do the factor assess baseline workup would be indicated because we don't need to miss something rather than just labeling as senile purpura which is common in all elderly patients the sessions of the questions are over so thank you so much once thank you